What a sweet spirit of fellowship is in this place this morning. Amen? Amen. It's great to be together. Great to be together. I'm glad you're here. And it's a joy for the McCords to be in Graham. And uh, we just are excited about our service and ministry that we will share together. And who knows how long. So as long as the Lord wills. And what a blessing that is. I understand that this is a big week. Is it true? I mean, I understand some of you are going to be going back to school. I didn't get a single amen or yay or can't wait at all. Are y'all excited? How many parents are excited? The parents are definitely excited. So, uh. You know, the, the, the going to school, it's, it's about stretching the mind and growing. I know it's painful, but, you know, there, there's no gain unless there is some. All right, so you, you young people, y'all just got to dig in this morning. But I thought I would help y'all get started and get you ready for school, to get your mind already active and strong. I, I want to know, do we have anybody in here going into the fifth grade? Any, got one? Any others? Um, one there is three or four, yeah? Y'all raise, keep your hands raised for just a second. Do, do you live in Graham or close by? Close by, do you live in Graham? Uh-huh, do you live in Graham? Okay, very good, very good. So here's, oh, I got another one back there. Do you, li- do you live in Graham, sweetheart? No. Do you live close by? Okay, all right, then you're still in, Okay. So here's the deal. Preacher John is going to play a game with you in just a second. And I just want to know, of those of you that raised your hands, fifth graders, I want to know if you would like for me to this week at school to bring you your favorite meal from your favorite restaurant. Keep your hand up if you'd like that. (laughs) Keep your hand up if you'd like for me to bring your favorite meal Hey, I'm telling you, anything you want, as long as the restaurant is here in Graham and I can go get it. Favorite? No, y'all are way past the fifth grade. (laughs) The Bible says some things about liars and people who misrepresent the truth. Back to my fifth graders. All right. All right. So, how many of you would like, who here would like to be in a little contest Kind of like who's smarter than a fifth grader. And if you win, then I'm going to get you your favorite meal from your favorite restaurant and bring it to your school this week with your mom and dad's permission. Let me throw that one in there. Okay, so I still got one back here. All right, sweetheart, come on down here. Come join me. Come on, come on, come on. Don't be shy. It's all, I promise you I will not embarrass you. You want this. I promise. Mom can come with you. Come on. Come on down here. This is good. So we're just we're gonna start our mental activities and work in here. Don't be scared. Really, really, don't be scared. There's hardly anybody here. Nobody's looking. <laughs> Nobody's looking. Tell me your name. Tell me your name. Tell me your name. Ava. Ava. All right, Ava. Come right over here. And I'm gonna hang out with you. You're gonna stay close to me. So just come on over here, Miss Ava. So, Rebecca, why don't you come here and just hang out with Ava? Just make her feel good. All right. So, Ava and Rebecca, just hang out with her. Y'all get up here on the stage right here. Very good. Now, for us to play this game really well, I'm going to have to get a really smart adult because you look really smart, and most of these people I know you're smarter than. And one of the smartest people I know is Dr. Travis Cadell. So I'm going to have to get Travis to come up here and help us. So, Travis, if you'll come right here. And just stand on the stage right here, right here. All right, Rebecca, you and Ava, y'all can move back just a little bit. And Travis, you stand right here. Now, I need two volunteers. Kai, thank you for volunteering. And then, and then Carrie, you volunteer too. So y'all come up up here. So, so I want to make sure Travis doesn't cheat, okay? Because I don't trust him. And uh, so we're going to create a blind. So Kai, I need you to hold one end of the blind. Right there, just right here. All right, y'all move up right here. I just don't want Travis. Y'all can't see Travis, and Travis can't see you all. So hold up the blind where Travis can't. All right, very good. Can you see, Ava, can you see Travis? Other than his feet, and they're ugly. And then, Travis, can you see Ava? No, I cannot. 
Okay, very good. All right. Okay. Um, so, here's the questions to win. Now, Travis, here's the deal. The same promise that I made to Ava, I'm making to you. So, if you win this, I'm coming to you at lunchtime bringing your favorite meal from your favorite restaurant. But I may need some help financially. Anyway. All right. So, if you know the answer to the question... Raise your hand, and I'll call on you. So, Travis and Ava, y'all have got to trust me, okay? I'm gonna tell, I'll know who, who raised their hand first. Here we go. All right, question number one. We're going to do five questions. You get three out of five to win, and then, um, and then I'll bring you the meal, whoever wins. Here we go. Question number one. So, we're working on our intellect. We're working on strengthening the mind here. So, very good. What is the smartest insect? What is the smartest insect? Ava, what is the smartest insect? A spelling bee. Very good. Y'all give it up for Ava. Very good. All right, that's one to zero, Travis. Question number two. Why do math books always look so sad? Travis. Very good. <laughs> Travis is smarter than I thought. He's on to me. All right, here we go. Question, it's one to one. Here we go. Question number three. Why did the teacher jump into the pool? Ava. Ava. She wanted to test the water. All right, give it up. Very good, very good. Very good. So it's two to one. Travis, are you ready? All right. Here's question number four. What school requires you to drop out in order to graduate? Ava. Skydiving school. Give it up for Ava. Good job. All right, just for fun, since Ava has won the contest, let me ask you one more question. And Travis, this is just to save face, just to keep you from feeling embarrassed, if, just consolation here. I tell you, if you get the question right, I'll bring you a meal too. All right, but not from your favorite one from your favorite restaurant. Spam, crackers. Why did the kid eat his homework? Because the teacher said it was a piece of cake. All right. Y'all give it up. Very good. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Travis, good job. Good job. Y'all can, can be seated. Good job, Ava. Way to go. Way to go. I'm so proud of you. That took a lot of courage to do that. You just never know what Preacher John will be up to. But uh, anyway, hey, school is starting, and I, I wanted to share some things from, uh, from God's Word, um, from God's Word about education and about school. I want you all to know just how important, and I'm especially talking to our young people today. Those of you that are going to school, I really want you to know how important it is to get that education. How blessed you are to have the opportunity to go to school and to grow that mind and, and develop that gift that God has blessed you all with. Education and learning are the primary ways in which we grow, not only to understand the world in which you and I live, but to engage in life with God. The reason we can learn is so that we can engage in life with God. You're like, well, wait a minute, John. Well, you know, how do you, mathematics, um, uh, science, uh, how, do, how do you engage with God in those kinds of things? Well, the scriptures tell us uh, that, that uh, I believe it was Isaiah the prophet, when he saw the vision of God, he says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so when you and I engage in learning, no matter what the subject matter is, we are discovering the magnitude of the glory of God. Amen. 
Amen. That's why education is so important for us. Uh, matter of fact, when Jesus, he had a, uh, a very educated man, well-schooled in the scriptures. I'm sure he had uh, accelerated degrees from Jewish seminary. And he comes to Jesus, and he asks him very sincerely, of all the commands, which is the most important? He had heard Jesus debating with the Jews, and he saw that Jesus was a, a teacher of great authority and was very impressed. He asked a most sincere question of all the commands. Which one is the greatest? Do you remember what Jesus said to him? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your, your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And the, teach, and the, and the gentleman, the, the, uh, the lawyer, the religious lawyer asking him the question, uh, complimented Jesus about that. And Jesus told him, he said, Sir, you're not very far from the kingdom of God. So when we think about the kingdom of God, living in the blessing of God is the experience of loving God with our minds. Now, I don't know about y'all, but when I was in high school, I was embarrassed to be smart, which wasn't too hard for me because I really wasn't that smart. But like, I, what I noticed was that people that desired to excel in learning and education were shunned by some of their peers. And, you know, so I, I found myself, like, struggling, like, if I really, like, try to pursue being smart, some people would look at me and, like, well, yeah, you know, aren't you, 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 you the teacher's pet, or, you know, you didn't want to sound very smart because people would, would look down upon you. Can I say hogwash for just a moment? That's not your problem. You know whose problem that is? That's their problem. God has blessed you with the mind and wants you to develop it to its absolute potential and its fullest. I want to read from you, for you, from Proverbs chapter 3. And it was written to a young man who was of school age, just like so many of you young men and women. And, and he says this, my son, do not forget my teaching. Okay, so we already know right off the bat to excel in the spiritual life and in all of life requires learning. Someone's teaching and someone's learning. And we can grow together. He says, don't forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Now, is there anybody here that would not like to have more peace and prosperity? Just go ahead and raise your hand. We want to laugh at you, right? Avery raised, you didn't get the question, did you, Avery? I mean, if you don't want to have peace and prosperity, only Avery would raise his hand. I don't want it. I hate peace and prosperity. <laughs> That's hilarious. We're going to talk a lot this week. Avery, I'm not so sure. We may have to get you to go back and do some remedial work. I don't know. Or maybe I didn't say it right. That's possible, too. But, uh, but who wouldn't want more peace and prosperity in this world? I mean, who wouldn't like to have a little left over at the end of the month to figure something out positive to do with? Right. And so there is teaching and learning and holding on to it and practicing these things that lead to, <clears throat> it's not a guarantee, but it's like this is how life works. When you learn well and you practice it, which the Bible calls obedience, you prosper. You do well, you flourish. And so he says, my son, keep this stuff close to your heart. And then he's, verse 3, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And listen to it close, verse 4. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. I see the guy, the teacher, saying it like this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. You know, it's like you're scaffolding the structures that are supporting you. Don't lean on your own understanding, the scaffolding of God. Stand on that. In all your ways, acknowledge him, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Like, life is just an easier walk when you trust the Lord and you commit everything to him. And so life is this process of, for us to learn God's word, to learn everything about God. 
including science and mathematics and, and language and every aspect of education that we can because the whole earth is full of the glory of God. And if you want to have a deep abiding and engaging relationship with God, then you've got to be a learner. You've got to take education serious. And by doing so, you're going to be blessed. Let me ask you a question. Wisest man, richest man in antiquity, his name was? We read about him in the Bible. His name was Solomon. Remember what the, the offer that God gave Solomon? I gave Ava a really good offer a while ago. I can't wait to go have lunch with her and bring her her favorite meal. And you know, so it's a pretty good offer. You know, it's not bad from preacher John. That's about that's getting to the limits of what we can do there. But but God, can you imagine God making an offer? Um, what would you like? Ask for anything that you want. Riches, wealth, political power, influence. Ask for anything that you want. If God had asked you that, what would you be asking for? You remember what God what what Solomon asked God for? It's the earliest Bible lesson, Kai, that I ever heard from Miss Clark, who was in her 80s, that was teaching me as a three-year-old or a four-year-old child. She taught me to pray Solomon's Prayer. I still remember that Bible lesson to this day. Of all the things that we can ask for, what's the most important thing that we should ask for? Wisdom, right? Because when we have wisdom, then we figure out how life works. There is a way... That, uh, you know that, that we you know that we live you know that the, uh, there there's a, a way that people choose to live but in the end it leads to death the scriptures tell us and so I want to read a passage to you and hear it as a warning because that's what it is it's from Isaiah chapter one and it has to do with how important education and learning is. And Isaiah is given a vision of something that's going to happen in the future for Israel, for Judah, and Jerusalem. And Isaiah's prophetic ministry is going to span the course of a number of very powerful political leaders of Israel. And Isaiah brings his prophetic message to Israel. And he acts as though he is... A prosecuting attorney. And the ones on the witness stand is God's creation. And so he begins his court case against Israel. He says, hear me you heavens. Listen, earth. For the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up. But they've rebelled against me. The ox knows his master, the donkey, its owner's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Israel had walked away from a knowledge of God to such a point that beast of burden Beasts that pull a plow, an ox, and a donkey have more sense than Israel does. Now, I don't know if I'd have written how to win friends and influence people, but if the very first thing you tell me is that I'm dumber than a... That didn't fall on deaf ears, did it? I would say, you've got my attention, Isaiah. And the question is, is that Israel has walked away from its knowledge of God. He says, woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a blood, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They've forsaken the Lord, they've spurned the Holy One of Israel, and they've turned their backs on Him. Why should you be beaten anymore, Israel? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured. Your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there's no soundness. Only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with olive oil. Your country is desolate. Your cities burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown 
by strangers. Daughter Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, like a city under siege, unless the Lord Almighty had left some survivors. We would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Now, this is a vision of what is going to come upon Israel. And Israel at the time had a hard time hearing this message because they were under the reign of Uzziah. And Uzziah reigned for, I believe, 52 years, one of the longest reigning kings in Judah and Jerusalem. And folks, it was good times. I'm talking, there was, the military complex was expanding. Lots of money, tax money, going into building up the uh, military apparatus. They had schools that were flourishing. They were making great progress in agriculture and were exporting. Money is coming into, into Israel. Good times are being had. Folks are having parties. They got enough money left over to go on vacation wherever they wanted to go, to have people over for parties and food with the best of the meals. I mean, they could, they could do whatever they wanted because the good times were here. And Isaiah says, oh, if you only knew what is coming. And the reason bad times were coming is because the people had failed to continue to learn God and to acknowledge God in the place of the world and to be blessed by God. You might say Isaiah could use a song from ACDC. To describe the state of Israel, we're on a highway to hell. But it doesn't look like it. I mean, it looks like everything is boom. It's great. It's good. I mean, people are watching HGTV and they're refinishing their houses and expanding. I mean, it's, it is just a burgeoning economic time. And Isaiah says... You've got trouble ahead. He says, um, the ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know, and my people do not understand. God had called Isaiah to preach at a time of spiritual regression, cultural indulgence, and selective injustice. Sounds very contemporary. To me. Now let me set that right here for just a moment. Let's table that. Well, that was then. Young people, did you know that every school that you see, public or private, whether it's religious or whether it's secular, is here today because of Jesus? Here in the United States and in Western Europe and all over the world, did you know that every school that you see, public or private, is here because of Jesus? Do you know that universities were created, first of all, to pursue a systematic knowledge of God? That's why universities were created. Did you know most of the world's languages were first set to writing by Christians? So that everyone could have a copy of and read the Bible. So almost every written language in the world was done because of Christian missionaries. Christianity has been the greatest force in promoting literacy all over the world. Did you know the Christian missionary movement of the 19th century pioneered tens if not thousands of schools throughout Africa and Asia and the Pacific Islands? They had the Great Commission, right? The Great Commission is to go and make disciples. And then what's the next word say? Jesus commissions his disciples. I want you to go and make disciples. What's the word right there in Matthew 28? I believe it's verse 18, if I'm not mistaken. Go and make disciples. Who? Somebody said it. Who was it? Who said that? D.D. Go and make disciples, teaching them. I have no idea what's going on, but they're having a good time back there. 
Dee Dee knows some Bible stuff now, folks, let me tell you now. Teaching them. That's what disciples do, we teach. And so schools were established from the very beginning of Christianity. Schools taught doctrine, they taught grammar, speech, logic, arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy. You know what the most significant innovation with new schools that were being created by Christians was? Do you know the most radical idea in the, all of education? Like, like in the ancient world, if you were, if you were educated, it's because your parents were rich, they were, they were po- politicians, or they were monarchs and kings, and you, that was how you were educated. You know who didn't get educated? Everybody that was poor. Ladies, you know who else didn't get educated? Women. Women did not get educated. Do you know who were the first people that created the first educational movements to where rich and poor men and women could be educated for the very first time? Do you know who originally included women in education? Do you remember the story where there's uh, Jesus had come to Mary and Martha's house and, and Martha's over there. She's making some food, preparing. Last week we talked about hospitality. She's doing that thing. That's what she's, she feels compelled and called to do. And then there's Mary. And the Bible tells us that Mary is where? She's seated at the feet of Jesus. Now, those of us who read English Bibles, we look at that and go, well, that's really interesting. You know, she get a little devotional, little devotional study with Jesus. I want you to know there's more going on there. That little phrase, sitting or seated at the feet of Jesus. Only students who followed a particular rabbi who were invited by that rabbi as an elite group got to sit at the feet of the rabbi. And the reason you get to see you are a part of that elite group is because once the rabbi has taught you, you are then to go and teach others. You become a rabbi. Don't let the radicalness of the text fall short of your mind. Jesus is teaching Mary so that she could be a rabbi. And so that she can go and teach others. And not, it's not just the 12 who belong at the feet of Jesus but also Mary. I want you to see, church family, how inclusive and how passionate Christians are and should be about education in the world, in the world today. Um, you know who started the system of educating by grades? Say it with me, Christians. Just, just let me try that again. Who started the system of educating by grades? Who started kindergarten? Who started educating the deaf? Who created schools for the blind? Who started Sunday school? Do you know why we started Sunday school? Because in Great Britain, young children were working at least 12 hours a day. This was before child labor laws. And the only day that they had off was Sunday. And they were poor, and they were uneducated, and they had no access to school. So a Christian man said, this is unacceptable. And so he started teaching Jesus and arithmetic and grammar to these young children so that they could find their way out of poverty. Do you know who the first ones were that started universities? It was Christians. You know what they taught? Theology, law, and medicine. Law, justice, medicine, healing, theology. All in all. Nowadays, you'd be hard-pressed to find a, a place of higher education that's not hostile toward Christianity. It's like folks have left the one that brought them to the dance. Christians are the ones who started universal education. By the way, do you know what university means? Anybody? Anybody? University, the word itself. You could Google it, but I'll tell you. It means one truth. Try to find a professor today at any university, which means one truth, that believes that there is one truth. So, the ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people don't understand. We're kind of in an educational crisis for just the, let me, aren't we? Because we've jettisoned and cut off 
theology from law and medicine and every other topic. And Israel is going to go into exile because of a lack of knowledge. Now, um, our children are not going to be taught about the love of God to love their neighbor as their self. to pray for your enemies, to do good to those who harm you, to be blessed when you recognize you're being persecuted, to see it as a blessing, because that's how they treated the prophets, Jesus would say, and everyone else that's faithful to the Lord. Our children aren't going to have these concepts unless what? I don't expect to go and have Christian or have schools, our public schools start teaching Jesus. But isn't it a blessing when our teachers show Jesus to those? Some of y'all are embedded in, in the schools, aren't you? And they get to experience God's love through you, God's mercy through you, God's truth through you. I can't today expect schools to teach God, the love of God, love for each other. And I think like Israel, who lost that knowledge, we'll see how it goes but you know what our children need to know the Lord amen and where are they going to be taught you're looking at it now mommies and daddies I know you put a premium on your kids going to school making those good grades so they can get into those choice universities God bless you but what good is it unless they know Jesus can I get an amen? amen? And where are they going to hear and be taught Jesus? Right here. So let me ask you a question. Are you bringing your kids here so they can learn Jesus? Just how important is it? How smart are you? Are we going to allow our kids to be dumber than a beast of burden? The ox knows its master. Shake that feed bag, that donkey will come running. It knows where the goodies are. But my people do not know. They do not understand. So I say all of that to say this. We're about to start a fall semester here at Eastside. If we want our children to thrive, if they want to be like Jesus, Growing in favor with God and man. Then we need them here. We need teachers and we need kids to be taught Jesus. Otherwise, the education is incomplete. Amen. Amen. By the way, if you're a teacher, stand up. If you're a teacher, administrator, coach, anybody working in our school district, I want you to stand up. Would y'all recognize these people with love? Stay, stay standing. Stay standing. And then all of you that are going to be starting school this week or have already started, I want you to stand up as well with them. Go ahead, all of our students. <clears throat> and let's pray. Stay standing. Stay standing. Let's pray. Almighty God. Let knowledge not fail here. Let understanding not fail here. But of all things, take you most serious. So that it might go well with us, Father. That you would not turn your face against us, but you would turn your face toward us and shine brightly upon us. Would you bless these students, Father? Give them the courage they need to pursue everything to the best of their ability so that they could engage you in glorious and beautiful ways. And Father, bless these teachers and coaches, administrators, and people that are mentors that are going to be helping them over the coming year. Father, will you bless them, encourage them, strengthen them, 
Father, I know it can be discouraging at times with the challenges that they face, but would you give them your energy, your love, your favor, your divine power, your spirit at work in them, Father, so that we would be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen. amen. We can serve you anyway this morning. We invite you forward while we stand and sing.